Fire the cannons! <laughs> no. Oh, he didn't have... Oh, wait, have... Rock-a-Boli! Yeah, yeah. I, didn't even see it I feel like I nailed that gene. Uh... Fire the cannons! Fire the cannons! Uh, this is the Sweat Equity Podcast, the number one comedy business podcast. On this blue marble we call Earth, uh, pragmatic entrepreneurial advice with real raw dog talk. Please, Lube. <laughs> Uh, listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, OnlyFans, yeah, yeah. Saying that. Uh, Substack, all that stuff. We're, we're, on, we're on all the business. We're going to fucking level up this show. What? It kills me. Um, yeah. This episode, stop. this episode is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one drag-and-drop CMS. What's a CMS? It's a content management system. You want to run your e-commerce store? You want to show a little portfolio? You got a local business that you need lead gen kind of set up? Bada bing, bada boom, it already indexes on Google. Squarespace is the shiznit. <laughs> don't get, uh... You don't... just said shiznit. <laughs> the shiznit. I'm sorry! <laughs> Should be saying. Uh, get the hookup. Holler if you hear me. We need, here is it? We need some Master P drops uh, in here make them say uh, um hit the movie the, i gotta tell you to watch hit the link in uh in the description get the hookup it helps you get a little discount it wets our beak a little bit over here and you know if you need any help hit us up uh, via email yeah on our website and hit up the merch store you want one of these these sweet tanks if you're watching on video i'm wearing and that we're wearing most times right Go over to sweatequitypod.com and hit the merch store for some swank tanks. Uh, <laughs> let's get going. Hotty toddy. What about my sweat equity? Sweat equity. Sweat, 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 sweat equity. My, my sweat equity. My, my sweat equity. What about my sweat equity? Yeah, I mean, we we could hear you okay. before. Yeah, I was I was. What happened was I had my headset on. I'm at Hyde Park. Okay. It looks like I'm at one of those. I, it looks like with the background. I don't know why it is. But it looks like I'm at one of those funeral things. You know where they go. Ooh, <laughs> remembering Dean. Yeah. Anybody that's listening on audio, it kind of looks like uh, Dean's in heaven. We're in a dream sequence with Dean. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, like you came back to tell us some sage, sagely advice, uh, which which is why we have you on anyway. Yeah, exactly. You gotta love the sage advice. <laughs> um, have people started calling you a legend yet? When they introduce you, I hear. Yeah, I'm a legend in my. I'm a legend in my own mind, Rob. <laughs> well, that that you didn't? Sure. Did you? No, but uh, it happens. Oh, you a, don't want to be the first one. I see. No, it happens a lot. I've noticed this. Like this is my hypervigilance or Asperger's or whatever, but I, I notice it on the comedy side, and because older comics hate it, but I started hearing it more off stage kind of introductions. Um, this guy's a legend in you know in sales or whatever, and you're like, oh. it, it's supposed to be a compliment, but it becomes an insult to a lot of older people. I don't know I mean, why. Well, it's not. It's it's definitely not an insult to me, but what what happens? What people don't even they'll say that, but they the general term they use he's a ninja in sales. Well, that's your that's your nomenclature that you've you foisted yeah. on everybody. Well, yeah. So they just they just mimic it back. <laughs> Trendsetter. Nice. Uh, that that's kind of branding. That's very uh, you know I say this as a compliment. Very Trump of you. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> he could throw an adjective in front of anybody he was campaigning against, and that stuck like crazy. Crooked Hillary, and then he would just keep telling you he's everybody a, likes a good nickname. He he has done it for thirty years, where he's just like I'm a great businessman, and then a lot of people are like, Yeah, he's really good at. <laughs> he's business. a great businessman. I just heard somebody say it, and you look Who was at that. You look at his track record. Him. You're like, right. mm, maybe uh, <laughs> you know, not so much, but. Uh, Trump aside, um, let's talk about how much you love Biden. No, um, <laughs> exactly. I'm out. Um, what? Uh, actually, actually, all kidding aside, I, what Biden's done for businesses, most people don't realize. I've always done best 
in inflationary, disjointed times. You, so you beat me to I'm the question. Up, I was going to say the last time we talked, you said this. Well, this we've is, done this before. This, We're at, I'm having deja vu, and I think we did it three times. And I think I said I, I had deja vu the second time. Well, well, this is getting really meta. Treja vu. Um, all right, but it's worth repeating because obviously we don't exactly remember <laughs> everything. Dug up his old notes. Well, Dean's like a jukebox. You can hit him with his his, his go to hits, yeah. and he he's got it. It's the greatest hits. I could wake you up in the middle of the <laughs> night, and you talk about the three circles uh, of sales and everything, uh, breakage, all that. Um, so we cut you off. So in times where there's uh, kind of what most people are having the fear based news, uh, looming recession. Um, inflation going up, uh, uh, I guess, an exponential rate to a lot of people. I don't know. We kind of avoid it like you do a little bit. Uh, but tell us why that, that's a good time for you. Well, because, because what happens is, is now when somebody moans about pricing or something, all you do is you go, yeah, you can say uh, Biden. That's all you have to say. Mm-hmm. And then they go, oh, yeah, it's horrible. You know, the Ukrainian war. You can blame anything. And what it allows you to do is adjust pricing today, where before when you'd adjust it, everybody go, why? Why are you adjusting prices? Why are you going up on your price? Now you just, if somebody goes, man, I just saw your price. You went up a bunch. And I go, yeah, mod. Mm. Inflation. Floodgates. Open the floodgates. Scapegoat. Somebody's just got to poke a hole in there first. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, most companies are more fearful of competition and pricing than is in fact the reality. And I was with a company today again helping them. And if you can get them out of their own way and they back into what they want to make, they generally find that competition is the least of their issue. <laughs> um, what do you think? They have that perception. I don't know. Maybe since they were kids or something, everybody says, oh, that business. I'll tell you, I'll give you the other side of it. It's like when I'm, I was with a group of professionals today, and they're going, you got to work hard. I go, you guys have never worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> Silent. <laughs> and they go, they go, yeah, we work hard. I go, no, hard work is in August. Like when I had my construction company. And you're working in the ditch 20 feet deep, and it's raining and 80, 95 degrees out, and you're a laborer. That's hard work. You sitting in an office at a laptop on the 45th floor of a building bitching about hard work is, you know. And I have the CEO, I have one CEO buddy, he goes, I grind. I go, you don't <laughs> grind? Oh. I mean, you, are you kidding me? I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, I mean, I would just love to see everybody put in their place. As soon as I'm feeling that kind of pity for like, damn, I've been doing a lot of hours sitting there. I do think of, I think of roofers a lot in uh-huh. the middle of summer in Tampa, Florida, and thank God I'm not or pool construction. I did that anything for two outside days. in Florida in the summer. Yeah. Sucks. but just the roof and the pool, especially because you don't get to benefit after it's done. <laughs> you just move to the next thing. You never get to swim in the pool. Yeah, the pool's the owner of the house. Cocktees. The owner of the house doesn't go, you did a great job. Take, you know, take a couple laps or just, you know what? We'll <laughs> yeah. have a barbecue for you guys. Like that never yeah, bring your family, bring your family. over. <laughs> yeah, <that's> yeah. <laughs> we'll leave the house. No, you just stay. Hard. That's that's hard work. I was again. I had a construction company or my tire company. We did commercial tires. When a guy's sitting on the side of interstate on a summer afternoon changing the tires on a eighteen wheeler because they hit a pipe or something, blew a tire out, and it's ninety nine degrees. He's got a truck jacked up. The sun's beating down on him. He's in a uniform. That's hard work. With cars flying by at nine hundred miles an hour, exactly. not paying attention. And I, I do find the guys that are more blue collar based. Uh, in their in their professional career, uh, happier than the white collar uh, people I know. That's just kind of a weird broad stroke kind of opinion, but um, I think some, there is something to working with your hands all day. That I don't know. The, no, just being in a shitty environment and doing something you don't want to do, and it smells bad, and it's uh, your own version of hell. Everybody should go through that at one point. 
Well, yeah, to know well, if you're. You know, I had a, go ahead. I, well, I had a pretty large construction company, and I can tell you that the laborers, I, my guys are going, yeah, they're laborers. And I go, they've been doing it 20 years. They're professionals. And when I engaged them and started empowering them, these guys that were just a hair over minimum wage, they love to win. And they would be highly productive. It was just insanely good. Um, I think I told you that time when we gamified when I was in high school and I gamified those prisoners and production in that uh, plant went up 20%. And the owner of the plant was meeting with my dad. My dad gave me this bad job because he wanted me to learn hard. And, um, you know, and, and, and then when I took the job, and I've gamified it with these prisoners that were coming in. They had nothing to work for, but gamifying it, production went up 20% because we had fun. We didn't get any more money. The management didn't accolade it. We didn't care. We gamified amongst each other who could tie their steel the fastest and pour their beds the fastest and be done first. And we bet a quarter a man. So it wasn't big money. You did that in high school? Yeah, my dad, my dad wanted to bust my ass. When, when I was in high school, so he got me a job working at a priest stress yard making those big beams for bridges because his friend owned it, and he wanted me to think how, like how hard it was. Uh-huh. The first week I was there, first day I was there, a bus pulled out. And guess where the bus was from? Yeah, county, county jail Prison. probably. Yeah, yeah. And so half the workers there were from jail. And so they were, you know, I'm a 17-year-old or whatever. They're just trying to, you know, treat me, and I was the grunt. And so I watched them pitching pennies and they would scream and holler and, and, and yell at each other. Like I just kicked your ass pitching pennies towards the wall. So I finally, after a week or so, I went, I went to my crew. I said, Hey God, you want to have some fun? And they said, yeah. I said, let's print the other three crews that we can tire steel, pour concrete, and get our bed approved first quarter of man. You guys in, they go, fuck yeah. And so we end up, doing it okay and so about a month and a half later we're every day everybody's competing we're all screaming and hollering time or steel month and a half later i'm at the house and mr young the owner of the company who's my dad's best friend who got me this glorious stupid ass job you know is sitting there with my dad in the backyard and he goes don i don't know what's going on at my plant right now but my production's up over 25 mm-hmm. percent High school was different for Dean. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> but what 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 happened was, and what I learned that day as a young man, when you learn to gamify your business and make it fun, people people are going to work for a living. They actually know about what they're worth, you know. But if they're having fun, they're going to outproduce anybody, mainly because they're having fun. And these guys had fun. We gamified. Makes sense. You Lots also people treat, don't have that competitiveness in their job. Well, you also treated them uh, like a human. I'm weird. guessing weird in this scenario. Well, but I was all, I was a laborer. That this is what they when, when I did with my companies. When I did with my companies, where I was CEO, yeah. But I was a freaking grunt labor, seventeen year old high school kid, you know, with hair down almost as long as yours, law today. So cute. And I was just yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and these these guys were prisoners. They had no motivation. They got the same pay. When they got on that bus, they didn't get to go out bar hopping or anything. They went back to jail. Oh, and when I, when I figured out gamifying, when they loved to win, and it wasn't about the money, we just had fun. And our production went up 25%, not on behalf of the company, but on behalf of us for our own fun. You know, we're kind of dancing around uh... – I, I, I've been kind of thinking a lot about incentives and uh, penalties, right? And that's kind of the, the biggest motivator with everything, right? Um, uh, how, how do you do that? How do you get a corporate culture to do that? How do you gamify that? You know, like well, it, the corporate culture, like we're a family and it's like, uh, what? What kind of family? It can't be that hard. It, it, what well, do they got to do? What is your uh, KPI? All right, whoever has the highest one, boom. Well, in sales, it's okay. very obvious, right? It's Did like, it. you know, here are the tools, go out and do it, right? Because um, it's very incentive-based just by nature of the job, typically. 
Um, well, I, I use I use my construction company because that's a glaring example of having of almost four hundred people that are mostly laborers and operators. You know, they're they're what I call the the work in work in America. Uh-huh. And what I would do is, is two or three times a month, I would just show up and work on a crew as a laborer. In fact, the funniest thing was, and then when I would show up, my best story was I was on a, a, a pipe crew. And we're 20 feet deep in a ditch north of I-4 on 22nd Street laying sanitary sewer. And I'm down ditch. there for the whole day. And it is hot. It's summer. And it was funny because my guys go, I go, I'm down there. I go, you know what's funny? And they all know me. It's not like undercover boss. And I'm a laborer. I'm helping them. And they, I go, you know what's funny? That city of Tampa guy that doesn't even know I'm CEO of the company. And one of my guys looks at me and goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> And, he, and I go, he doesn't know I'm the CEO. He goes, yeah, he do. And I said, How, what makes you think he knows I'm the CEO? It's because there's nobody in a pipe ditch with alligator boots and a gold Rolex that ain't somebody besides <laughs> labor. And I, they all started laughing. Well, what happened was, is this particular instance, I got, as I built trust, I said, what would you guys do to help your, your job and make it easier, better, and faster, gamify and they said, we need a hydraulic pipe puller. I go, what does one of those do? They go, it hooks on the pipe, brings it home. We can increase production 20 plus percent. I go, well, why wouldn't we have one? And everybody goes, well, they say it costs too much money. I said, how much one does one cost? And they go, I bet that damn thing's $1,500, D. Well, my backhoe that was up there on top of the hill that was digging the ditch was a million dollars. The front end loader that was back to him was three hundred grand. The bulldozer was one hundred fifty grand. The two guys with foreman shirts were probably eighty grand each. I go, are you kidding me? And they go, no. So I come down in the ditch. I get the backhoe to come down. It picks me up, brings me up to the top of the ditch, and it's now two or three in the afternoon. I went to my foreman. I go, those guys are telling me a hydraulic pipe puller would increase production. And these guys looked at me and they go, you know, I never thought about it. Probably would. I guess somebody better get their happy ass in the truck right now and go get one. So they went and got them. What happened was that traveled through the whole organization. Because what did the people in the ditch feel? What do you think they felt? They felt heard. Valuable. Yeah. Valued and heard. And now we just started, the more our people felt empowered, the crazier, cool stuff they had. They've been in the business 20 years. They've seen every stupid mistake on the planet. They knew what to do, but nobody would. Have, their comment to me was, "Nobody ever listens to us." I thought you were going to say that you took your problem. Rolex off and were like, "Go buy two. <laughs> Bring yeah. me the change." <laughs> Backhoe but was we, my name happened? in high school. Um, go ahead. I bet sitting on that, but one. not for the same reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I went to all guy school, so you, you take it from right. there. Um, yeah, I, I cut you off. You were about to say, it. "Is that? I mean, no, is I, is that more you about?" Cut him off again. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, he may have lost his train of thought. You don't know. Uh, he, he's a spry seven-year-old, but, uh, you know, it's very a- AARP. I, and by the way, for those on video watching, thank you for dressing up for the podcast. I mean, we're tickled pink. Oh, you mean me? Yeah. Well, this is my uniform every day. I wear a white shirt, you know that, jeans and a black sport coat. And then you want to see some really watch this. Oh boy! Oh, he's Anybody pulling, out, he's pulling out his penis, guys. Oh no! <laughs> Whoa, look at oh, that. nice! Did you see him? Wow! You have Are all those your boys. All five of your sons' headshots on your uh, low top Converse. I think those are on my chucks. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, where'd you, what? I want a pair. What place in Panama City did you get that done? <laughs> no, you know what? I've got my son's ordering for me. I I've got twenty five pairs of custom chucks. That's fun. Is that because that's how that, those are the shoes y'all played in when you played basketball? No, what happened was, honestly, what happened was is my wife helped the brother in law laundromat. She came home and we give the, the extra clothes people leave in the laundry for two weeks. We give them the Metropolitan. They're clean. We give them. And what happened was she was dumping them out to sort them, and there were a pair of red chucks. And I went, man, those, I had those in high school. So I put the chucks on. And I was downtown at my office, and I'm sitting there at, with my red chucks on, 
and these two smoking hot 20 something year old UP chicks walk by and go, those are hot. I went home and just started wearing chucks. Yeah. Chucks. <laughs> don't, yeah, and those are the shoes now. That's what you wear now. Yeah, I, I That's decided. I definitely thought yeah, that was going the way of my wife told me they look good <laughs> <laughs> because the that, wife usually yeah. tells you, no, you're not wearing those or that looks good. Uh, that definitely took a turn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but even today I've had today, I've been at breakfast and stuff this morning. I've had people walk by and they go, Oh my God, those chucks are insane. Is that your family? I go, those are my sons. They go, those are the coolest shoes I've ever seen. So they create a conversation starter, and I have 25 pairs. So I wear a different pair every day. You know, and they just are great conversation starters. It kind of looks like you're a big K-pop fan, if you didn't know they're, they're your sons. It looks like a boy band yeah. on the side. It's Because your kids are all good-looking men, so it's all, you know, it kind of looks like uh, I really miss NSYNC. This is my statement. But they, I, I guarantee you, when we all five go out or the six of us go out somewhere, hey, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Really? Uh, Please elaborate. Well, I mean, on previous episodes, if anybody wants to go back, uh, you, you did tell us how to uh, pull people in, pull women into you, picking them up at a bar by kind of not paying attention to them, buying a drink and just kind of moving your body yeah, language. Cool guy. Yeah. We're, the walk by. The walk by. That's what it's called. Yeah. Um, which I, I think is a good metaphor for kind of. Uh, branding and, and marketing for a lot of companies. Nice. They're, well, you want to bring people into your your business. What are you about and stuff? But it, the power of no kind of thing. If you kind of you no, go, I don't, don't want your business. It, it, no. For whatever reason, it will attract people. I I, I, I find that out. Um, I did uh, have a text from you. The la- you know we haven't uh, had our, our breakfast in a while at Tahitian Inn where all the ballers in Tampa Bay. Have. Right. Um, but, uh, the last thing I was talking to you about, I was texting with you is, uh, you know, you said you were trying to stamp out the worst disease in the U S right now. And it's impacting- self-talk, <laughs> right? That's- was that what it was? Well, I said monkey pox yep. cause I, I nailed that, that set. Bro, you don't even study for these podcasts, <laughs> do you? Like I do. Uh, and so what, you know, what, what I'm interested, what was bringing that on? Are you experiencing a lot more self-talk out of people lately? Well, I've experienced it a lot, you know, pretty much all my career. Uh, but it seems like right now there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise. And, you know, uh, it's like the economy and all this other stuff. If we take care of what's within our own purview, uh, generally most of this outside stuff doesn't affect you especially in the United States. I mean, you know, we'll let, we'll let all the social media platforms and everything. I, I think I told you the story about my son talking about the cigarettes of this generation and that it's the average person's on social media two and a half hours a day. It's, I think it was somewhere around, I think it's 40 work weeks a year when you do the math on it. It's like stupid numbers. And um, yeah, so self-talk, Self-talk, I've run into people all the time, and they convince themselves of stuff that's just not true. And I'll ask them, I'll go, what made you think that? Like the competition, I go, oh, it's competitive. I go, How, what makes you think that? Oh, I just know. No, what makes you think that? And I've gone and secret shop their competitors. I did that to a company one time. They told me it was their prices were way, you know, they were had to be competitive. I went and secret shopped all their competitors. They were 15 to 20% cheaper than their competitors. And they didn't even know it. Right. You can, you can create these, um, you can create these kind of anxiety goblins that, because you never took the, uh, the kind of analytical step to go, well, what is my competition? Instead of just going, I know it, this goblin is in the closet. It's under the bed. It comes out at night. Mm. You know, like you can kind of create these these weird uh, obstacles with if you can't. Th- this is good self talk, maybe I'll say. Like sometimes I'll just say out loud by myself, like, "Is that really a thing?" Uh, I haven't even looked at it. I should go look at it. You know that kind of thing. Uh, is that is that what you're kind of experiencing? We used to call it the fear of the unknown on this show a lot. Uh, I would say there's a couple of things. One is 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 people talk about being overwhelmed and stuff. There's, 
the one fact that I had a meeting today on it, there's only one thing that's universally equal, which is what? Everybody has the same time? Right. Same Damn. 24 in a day. Nice. Yeah, but, but it doesn't matter. Tied. So when people tell me all this noise, I actually, and you know this law, I have a timer on my phone for 10 minutes. If you do 10 minutes a day at 60 hours a year, 10 minutes a day, I've written two books. I've, I can't even tell you all the stuff. I've got licenses and all kinds of different things, and I do it at 10 minutes a day. When the timer rings that it's 10 minutes is up, I quit working on it. And what happens is everybody can find 10 minutes a day. And when you eliminate your self-talk and you put your goals together and you determine who you want to be, you just, you just know you have the same 24. So quit making excuses. Right, right. Do you ever have a self-talk, Dean? I mean, I, I, you know, at my age now, my biggest self-talk is, um, you know, what can I do? You know, I try to help somebody every day for no pay. That's on my mission. Uh, so my self-talk, I, I, I'm sure I do, but I don't really have it that I know of because I'm always self-talking what my possibilities are. So when I get up in the morning, I, you know, I, I know all the Circle K ladies in <laughs> two counties because I get my, I get my, how do you not, brag, how do you not have diabetes? I don't, <laughs> you get a big gulp or whatever Circle K is every day, every morning, yeah, two a day. Yeah. <laughs> and so what happens is, is, you know, I do all this stuff and I just, it's fun. My passion now is helping people be the best versions of themselves. And I, whether I used to do that as employees in my company, and I would say that most of the people that were ever, that I ever worked with today, the younger people are mega successful business owners that have hyper grown their own companies having worked with me. And still reach out to me and all the time and text and tell me, man, we just hit a hundred million or whatever. Thank you. I still follow the principles. So yeah, uh, that's my side. So it's more like negative self-talk. We should differentiate. You just need the positive oh, yeah, yeah. self-talk. Well, yeah, most people's or, or the biggest thing is misconception self-talk. Maybe not even sure. negative. It's like the old guy saying it's competitive. And then when I do the math, the three circles that you guys remember, and I go, well, you, you lose this much sales you don't even know about. So how can you tell me it's competitive when 90% of the sales you're not getting, nobody even knows you exist? Shut up. Mm. Right. You don't even know the market share or the TAM or, you know, any of that. Yeah. And like uh, you, basic competition research would, you know, a, a Google search. Maybe. Right. You can look up stuff online, almost anything. For, you can look up pricing. It's and there. you would you would think you would think that this would be very fundamental, but I can't even tell you how many marketing companies I work with where they the owners of the companies will say the marketing company will say, What's your budget? And they'll go, Well, I could spend ten grand. The marketing company will go, Okay, we'll market for ten grand. Then they don't have the measurements for leads or whatever. So when I go in and start dissecting, and I ask the marketing company, What's their cost of customer acquisition? And they go, Well, I don't know. What's their oh, cost that's... of lead? I don't know. What's their traffic cost? I don't know. So then I sit down with the owner and I said, what's your cost per lead? I don't know. What's your cost back? They don't know. When we dissect that, that's where, when we had like ideal image, we spent $25,000 per month per location. Like a table, we spent 150 grand a month. People would go, how can you spend that? Because I said, we know exactly what our lead cost is, our conversion cost, and what our customer acquisition cost is. And it wasn't even 10%. Then so we Oh, we did. That's why we grew the company. Yeah, I mean, specifically in this case, I was literally researching last night for a friend. I'm trying to help out uh, about this, and I go, "Look, here's your." I pulled industry numbers. I go, "Here's what cost per lead, cost per acquisition. Here's your average revenue of a of a new patient. Here's your lifetime value uh, on the on an average basis." And then I don't even know your capacity rate. Let's put it at eighty. What you call breakage. Um, and right. then, and then, uh, what, um, and then this is everything without referrals uh, for your lifetime value, which is a, a big part of their industry and send it over to them. And I had to, I had to write out a similar thing. Budgets aren't dynamic or budgets are dynamic according to performance. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And eventually the goal would be to get you to get a model set up 
to be able to flip that on or off, you know, if you want. Right. You can ramp it up, or if you're at max and there's a waiting list that's too long, we can we can tamp it down. But And sometimes you can spend too much and get no return. It's a nice meaty middle sometimes. Yeah, yeah but well, but if you're if you're doing that, that if you're spending and not seeing a result, you've got a whole big nother issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so maybe ten years ago, I wouldn't feel confident to go. Hey, let's start. I want I want to use you as a trial. I'm trying to make it as a use this as a case study eventually. But like, I'll go. We'll. I'll. I'll do the minimum with this rate. But here's what I want in return. I want to have a, kind of a testimonial from you when I crush it for you on this. Um, and by the way, I, I keep thinking about this. I've I've finally kind of just revived my old agency and I keep thinking about you when you I was talking to you a long a while back and you're like, do you want a J O B? Um, and so, uh, you know, I was kind of split in time. Like, should I go full time somewhere? Uh, should I, you know, I was kind of doing a uh, half in half out and now it's kind of, uh, it's really come to fruition. I should listen to you earlier. That's kind of really what I was getting to. <laughs> Everything you've, you've kind of told me is like, uh huh, and then it'll take me like a couple of speed bumps or hiccups, and I'll go. Oh yeah, should just should just listen from the get go. Well, you know another thing, Rob, that a lot of companies don't do, and it's amazing to me. They do not take a demographer and figure out who their demographic really is. Mm-hmm. They do what I call fly by. In, they don't fly by the instrument; they fly by emotion. They say, mm-hmm. "My customers this well." I would say 99.9% of the time when I go into companies, they have it wrong. And what's even doubly wrong is their marketing companies have it wrong. And so their marketing companies haven't insisted. It'd be like being a heart surgeon and somebody walks in and you go, okay, we're going to take, we're going to do open heart surgery. We haven't even taken my blood pressure. Doesn't matter. I'm a heart surgeon. Marketing companies are, are telling them, here's what you need to do, blah, blah, blah. They don't even ask, who is your customer? Let's do a Let's spend some money and find out exactly what your customer looks like. In all the cases I've ever done it, the CEOs and marketing companies were wrong. (laughs) Yeah, and that to me is like a fundamental thing if you're helping someone out. Like that's question number one a lot of the time. Like who do you think your audience is that we're trying to – Yeah, but you can't pay attention to them. Right. No, no. I'll go – I – I actually kind of you've kind of reiterated this in my kind of habits of doing any intro or discovery meeting. I want to ask them, then I want to go look up, and I want to because it's a hypothesis in my head, right? What they're telling me, and then I want to go, all right, let me see the CRM da- data, or let me let me look at, and then let me look at the macro part of it. What's the area if you're a local business, let's say, like let, I want to see the me, the the demographics of that area, you know, whatever the range is. Uh, if you're a stylist, like within 10 miles or something like that. Um, and then really look at it and go, oh, it, again, and it brings up, hey, this, that's the opportunity you're really missing. And what you kind of reiterate a lot too is don't get hung up in tactics. Uh, you know, go macro to micro with all of this. Has to be the approach. So we'll hire him for that. I don't know how to end that rant. Um, yeah. Well, I know, but what I've what I found is, is is I found companies like one of the companies I'm helping now meeting after we hang up here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to an event, a team building event we're doing tonight. But one of the funny things is, is when we started looking at it, that their marketing team is using Instagram. So I do the deep dive and download their CRM, all their customers and stuff. Their average customer is a. 55 year old 60 year old female mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so hot on instagram instagram yeah, hey oh nice. count it yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and so there's a big disconnect you know and 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 then when we look at where people come from they're convinced that people fly from around the country which they do but the bulk of their customers come or the bulk of their leads come from within call it 15 miles of their offices so I go, how do we convert those? And then that becomes the impetus because we have plenty of leads. And then the marketing company is always screwing with it, trying to, well, we need to have a drip campaign. We need to do this. I go, what's the customer worth? And everybody goes, what do you mean? Well, the customer's worth 15 grand. 
a $15,000 customer, you think I'm going to treat them like a, a mass customer? No. They've been inbound lead, giving me their uh, all their data. I'm going to literally, I'll probably get in the car and go hug them. Right. Right. Yeah. You can't treat them. You're not at that volume yet. You're not the best yet to be able to, yeah, to be able to do that. You know, but even if I was, if you go to Tiffany's or you go to Louis Vuitton, right. Okay. Yeah. And they get your contact when you walk in, they don't think you're just another purse person. Well, they do. when They they see law. Yeah. My sister actually used to work at Tiffany and they'd be like, sir, you lost. And I'd be like, um, just another purse person. (laughs) My sister works here. Yeah, if law walks in, they go, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you're probably looking for Gordon's down the hall. <laughs> They're like, we don't, be we don't have any thigh necklaces for you. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, the, one, uh, the last thing I want to leave on is um, when we were meeting last time, I thought this is kind of a good insight, is we were talking about uh, the last time we had breakfast was what you were telling me about the smartphone. What was kind of the... The observation you were giving me. Why? Why? What's the most important feature of this smartphone that we've had 15 years? The off button. You mean when, when we were talking about? Give me a hint back. Well, <laughs> it was. It, it was basically you're like, what's the most important? What? What? What is the most valuable thing that came out of uh, like the iPhone or any smartphone? And you said it was the ability to take pictures. Uh, to re- oh, yeah. to record what's going on. I think you were talking to me about something with your son, but um, well, one of the five. But uh, I thought that was a really good insight because you know I kind of think that as well. We take it we take it for granted. We have this camera, or we have the ability to record audio. Uh, I think we were talking about something in the news, someone getting caught saying something wrong. But I don't know if you had any more thoughts on that, or maybe I just made this conversation up. Well, no, no, no. The smartphone. The smartphone has changed our entire planet. Uh, you know, it's a, a the smartphone I'm talking to you on right now is, is more powerful than the computer, both in storage, to the processing, moon. everything that ran my entire statewide tire company. And the smartphone today gives you access. Well, the good news, it gives you access. The bad news is it gives you access. And what happens now is everything's real time. So what will happen? You see it on the news. You'll see a video and what angle it's shot at. Somebody will think somebody did X, and at a different angle, it's something different. And, and now what's even crazier to me, you'll see a murder going on, and nobody's doing anything about it but recording it. There's four people standing there with their iPhones recording some guy getting stabbed. And, you, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, we got to record it. Now we know about it. Who the hell is helping the guy getting stabbed? Well, you know, back in the day... <laughs> Well, Back in the day, we would jump on the guy that was stabbing the guy. Us too. And we'd all pull him off. For sure, us yeah. Too. Yeah, we're totally right there with you. on board. We're kind of old souls in that way. Definitely. Wouldn't even think about it. But you look today and you, you sit there and you go, oh, wait a minute. How could it be possible we have a, three video recordings of a random person getting mugged and stabbed on a subway? I mean... Yeah, everybody standing there with their phones recording it like, oh, man, if I get good content, I may... Be an influencer. Yeah, it's it, it is a funny thing that that's your f- trigger when something is happening to record it and not actually be involved. I don't know if I get involved in a, a stabbing. Stabbing. Maybe is, the guy who sense. the guy who got thrown. Do you see the the video of the dude who got pushed into the subway track? Uh, no, yeah. but I can imagine. Yeah, and he bad. he's alive still. But uh, it's Whoa. one of those things where you're like. I could shoulder check the guy that was about to push him. Like I could get my John Lynch on with that. But, you know, a lot of people aren't, their face is in their phone. <laughs> you know, they're not even looking around until they hear a scream usually. Yeah. But yeah. And so just times are different now. And the good news is, the good news is now with these times that are different, it's kind of like being in a race of slower people. You know, you know, the old story about uh, the guy, He's sitting there and, and he, he's lacing up his tennis shoes when the tiger jumps out. And the other guy looks at him and goes, you can't outrun a tiger. He goes, don't have to. You just have to outrun you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of that way now. Right now, there's never been as good an oppor- or if there's such a word, but as great of an opportunity for people to be successful in whatever they want to do today because of technology, 
all the factors allow somebody that wants to to be so successful today where 30, 40 years ago you didn't have the same opportunity. So these are great times. And if you eliminate the self-talk, convincing yourself of what won't happen or can't happen, and you take ownership of the possibilities, it's crazy. And I see it every day. That's a good note to end on. Perfect. Appreciate you coming on again. Always uh, well, I love the legend, Dean Akers. The legend, Dean Akers. <laughs> well, I love both of you guys, and both of you guys are rock stars. And I'm love glad you you're doing this for the community. And, and if I can ever help anybody, you know I'm there for you. Uh, we'll grab breakfast we soon, my friend. It. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye.